<coughs> so now that we've got a handle on combining basic fractions together, we're going to look at complex fractions. And all that's complex about them is we've got fractions inside of fractions, which isn't very nice. So complex fractions are kind of really informal definition. It's just fractions inside of fractions. And we want to make those look nicer when possible. So we're going to examine two different cases for any kind of complex fraction. They fall into one of these two categories. So in the first one, if I'm trying to simplify x divided by 4 divided by 3 divided by 2, when I've got a fraction divided by a fraction, we can always flip and multiply. We don't have to try to compute in our heads how many times 3 halves fits into this other fraction. So when it fits that form of fraction divided by a fraction, instead of dividing by a fraction, we can multiply by the reciprocal if I flip it upside down. So if I've got a fraction divided by a fraction, all we're going to do is flip and multiply. So what does that mean? Another way that we could actually write this complex fraction is as follows. We've got x divided by 4, and we're trying to divide that by what? 3 halves. So if we don't want to see it in one giant complex fraction form, we can rewrite it kind of linearly like this. And then when we see it in this way, instead of dividing by a fraction, we can flip and multiply. So the first one always stays exactly as it is. So x over 4 stays exactly as it is, but division now becomes multiplication. And we're multiplying by what? The reciprocal of 3 halves is 2 thirds. So we're trying to combine together 2x and 4 times 3. And we want to reduce that down. 2 goes into 4 how many times? 2 goes into 4 twice. So up top we've got x all over what? 2 times 3, 6. So we've simplified our complex fraction, a fraction inside of a fraction, down just to 1. We've made it look a little bit nicer. When it fits that form, we take the second one, flip it, and multiply. So that's the first case. We've seen those types before, but it hasn't been displayed to us in this original version as a complex fraction. So what's different about this one compared to what we were just working with? So in this case, I've got a fraction plus a fraction over a fraction minus a fraction. So this is a big mess. I don't have one whole fraction up top like we did over here and one whole fraction down below like we did over here. So we can't do this process. But when we have an ugly mess like this, that's my best way to describe it. If we've got a mess, how do we handle it in this case? If we've got a big mess of fractions, what do we do? We want to multiply every single term, all of our little fractions inside of the large one, by the LCD of all of those small denominators. So we're going to multiply every term by the LCD of the small fractions. Small meaning it's not this large one. Each individual little fraction. And what is that going to do? If I choose a number that's divisible by 4, 6, 8, and 2, we can make all of those small fractions go away. So let's off on the side try to build what is our least common denominator between all of these denominators. So what are we considering? We want to build the LCD between which values? Between 2, so we'll have to take that into account and it's already prime, 8, which we'll have to break up and that's fine, 4, and 6. So let's break each of these down into the primes and build the smallest common multiple between them. So 2 is already prime and 8 breaks up into what? 4 and 2. 2 is prime and 4 we can break up into 2 and 2. 
4 has 2's living inside of it. We know that drill by now. And 6 has 3 and 2. So our LCD has to t take into account all of the factors of at least one of them. So I'm going to start with 2. And what is our LCD missing that 8 has? Two more 2's. Are we missing anything in our LCD from 4? No. Are we missing anything in our LCD that 6 has? A factor of 3. So as we multiply all these together, what's our least common denominator between all of those denominators? So 3 times 2, we get 6, times another 2 is 12, times another 2, 24. So what do we do with that LCD? We multiply every single term everywhere by that LCD. So this one times 24. This one times 24. This one times 24. And this one times 24. And why are we allowed to do that? So I've got 24 divided by 24, which is what? 1. So we're just changing what these look like. Same story over here. 24 divided by 24, just 1. So we aren't altering the expression at all. We're just changing what it looks like. And we've chosen our LCD to be divisible by every single one of these. So nice things are going to happen as we start to simplify. So up in the upper left, we know that 24 is divisible by all of the denominators. So let's do that division first. So we're dealing with smaller numbers. So 2 goes into 24 how many times? 12. So that one is reduced. So now we have what? 12 times 1, which is just 12. Got rid of one of the fractions? Great. Next in line, 8 goes into 24 how many times? 3. And what is 3 times 3? We get 9. Got rid of the other fraction. Nice. Same story down below. We'll do the division first. 4 goes into 24 6 times. And 6 times 3 is 18. And we're subtracting off what value? So 6 goes into 24 4 times. And 4 times 1 gives us 4. So we use that LCD to get rid of all those tiny fractions. Now we're just dealing with one fraction that we can make look nicer. As we add across the top, what is our total in that case? We've got 9 and 12, which will give us 21. And I've got 18 minus 4 down below. <laughs> 18 minus 4, which is 14. Spoiler alert. And we can reduce these by what? They both share a 7 in common. So 7 goes into 21 how many times? 3. And 7 goes into 14 twice. So we can reduce that complex fraction down to 3 halves. And we did it by multiplying every single term by our LCD. So when it fits this super messy form, that's what we're going to do. Because that's the quickest way to get to the end. And when we've got a fraction divided by a fraction, we're just going to flip and multiply because we've had practice with that as well. All right, so let's keep practicing with a few more examples before you try your own. In this example, what form do we fit? Fraction divided by a fraction or a complete and total mess? Complete and total mess. And you probably think that for all of them, but in this case, complete and total mess. So we want to find the LCD between all of these fractions. And we can break off every single one of those terms off on the side, but these numbers are pretty small. So let's try to build it without breaking down into the primes, physically writing them down. Let's do it in our heads. So my least common denominator has to be divisible by 2, so I need to take that into account. And it has to be divisible by 6. And what does 6 have living in it? A 2, which we've already taken, and a 3, which we're missing. So our LCD needs a factor of 3. Okay, moving along. Right now it's got 2 and 3, and 4 has two factors of 2 living inside of it. So what is our LCD missing? That 4 has another factor of 2. 
And is our LCD missing anything that this last term has? No, we've already taken it into account. So our LCD between 2, 6, 4, and 3 is going to be what? 12. So we take 12 and we do what with it? We multiply it everywhere. Multiply it everywhere. Multiply it everywhere. Multiply it everywhere. So every single term needs to be multiplied by that LCD. And the LCD is divisible by all of those denominators. So let's do the division first. So we're dealing with smaller numbers. So 12 divided by 2, what does that give us? Or 2 goes into 12 6 times. 6 times 1 gives us 6. Got rid of the fractions? Great. Next one. 6 goes into 12 2 times. 2 times 1 is 2. Simplified the numerator of our large fraction. Let's go for the bottom. 4 goes into 12 how many times? 3 times. And 3 times 3 is 9. So what I mean by doing the division first is we could have taken 12 times 3, which is 36, and then divided it by 4, which is 9. But it's easier to work with smaller numbers like 3 times 3 and do the division first. So the same story over here. We could take 12 times 2, which is 24, and then 24 divided by 3, which will give us 8. Or it's easier, I think, to do the division. 3 goes into 12 how many times? 4 of them. And 4 times 2 is 8. So both will get us there. But dealing with smaller numbers, especially when we can't have a calculator, is helpful. So now that we've simplified, let's just combine across the top and across the bottom. 6 and 2 together gives us 8. 9 minus 8 gives us 1. 8 divided by 1 is really just 8. So we simplify that ugly, complex fraction down to 8. So it's going to be the same story on this bottom fraction down here, bottom complex fraction. And if we need to see fractions everywhere, what can we put this 2 over? 2 over 1. If we want to see fractions everywhere, we can always do that. So in this case, the bottom one is already condensed together, which is nice, but we still have a mess. There's fraction, fraction, another fraction. So building the LCD, what do we need to take into account? Has to be divisible by 5, so we'll take that guy has to be divisible by 1. Everything is divisible by 1, so multiplying by 1 won't change anything. And then what are we missing in our LCD that 10 has? So what factor are we missing from this guy? A 2. So the least common denominator is 10. So what do we do with that thing? Multiply it everywhere. Multiply it everywhere. Multiply it everywhere because we're choosing a value that's divisible by all of those bottoms so that they go away. So as we reduce, I say let's do the division first, make life easier. 5 goes into 10 how many times? Twice. And I've got 2 times what? Times y. So we've got 2y. And we're subtracting off of that. What's 10 divided by 1? Just 10. And 10 times 2 is 20. And then down below, if we do the division first, what's 10 divided by 10? 1, it goes away. 1 times 3 gives us 3 down below. And can we reduce that farther? No. So we're done. So there's two for you to practice of the different types. So in part A, we just have a fraction divided by a fraction. So we keep the top one exactly as it is, nothing changes there, and we multiply by the reciprocal of the second. And the reciprocal just means flip it upside down. So 12 was down below, now it'll live up top, and 15 was in the top of my small fraction, so now it will live in the bottom. And we can reduce that before we multiply together and see what we get. So 12 divided by 12, gone. And 5 goes into 5 once, and 5 goes into 15 three times. So this will reduce down to one-third. 
much nicer than what we started with. And again, we had to multiply by the reciprocal because we had that form one fraction divided by one fraction. But in part B, we've got a mess. We've got tons of fractions everywhere. So we have to build our LCD. And again, you can write off on the side, break it into the primes. But I think we've had enough practice that we can work on building without writing all those down. So what are the factors of six? Two and three. So my LCD has to be divisible by that one. And are we missing anything that this denominator has? Nope, we've taken it into account. Are we missing anything in our LCD that this one has? Nope, we've taken the two. And then what lives inside of nine? Nine is three and three. So our LCD is missing what? One more factor of three. So our LCD then, if we multiply all of those together, what do we get? Three times three is nine, nine times two, 18. And what do we do with 18? Multiply it everywhere. Multiply it everywhere. Multiply it everywhere. Multiply it everywhere. So you could probably see in this example how beneficial it was to do the division first. Because I don't want to have to do 18 times 7 and then divide it by 6. That's too big. It's going to be a waste of time. But we know that 6 goes into 18 how many times? 3. And 3 times 7 is more manageable. What does that give us? 3 times 7, we get 21. Same story over here. Let's do the division first. 3 goes into 18 6 times. And 6 times 2 gives us 12. Down below. 2 goes into 18 how many times? 9. And 9 times 3 is 27. And then we're subtracting off whatever term pops out here. 9 goes into 18 2 times. And 2 times 8 is 16. So we got rid of the small fractions. Now let's make that larger fraction look nicer if we can. As we add across the top, what do we get? 21 and 12 together will give us 33. And then down below, we've got 27 minus 16, and that gives us what? 11. So I've got 33 divided by 11, which reduces down to 3. So the last thing in this section that we're going to do is review the order of operations. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So what is our order? How does it happen? We've got parentheses, exponents. We've got parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division from left to right, and addition and subtraction from left to right. And from now on, I'm going to keep writing it in that way so we don't think we're not tempted to think that multiplication comes before division. Because when we have a mix, it just goes from left to right. So let's work at simplifying some of these complex uh, expressions using our order of operations. So in this first example, what should we compute first? So the P represents parentheses. Can we do anything on the inside of our parentheses? No. So next in line, we should deal with the exponents. So this tells me to take 4 fifths times itself, 4 fifths, 2 times in total, and then subtract 1. So as we evaluate the exponent, what do we get? 4 times 4, 16, 5 times 5, 25. And we're trying to subtract off 1 from that. So in order to combine those together, we need to have common denominators. And what is the least common between these two? 25. And if we need to see 1 written as a fraction, we can put it as what? 1 over 1 is still the same fraction. So to get common denominators, what do we have to multiply 1 by? 25, top and bottom. So equivalently, now we have 16 25ths, and we're trying to subtract... 25 25ths, which is really just 1 off the back. So we have the same denominator, so we'll keep that. And we have to perform 16 minus 25. 
So which one holds more weight, the positive or the negative? The negative. And what's the difference between those two? Nine. Negative nine twenty-fifths. And we're done. And in the next one, we're trying to multiply these two things together. And please excuse my dear Aunt Sally tells us to do what first? Deal with the inside of the parentheses. So inside each of them, we want to combine together two fractions. So in order to do that, what do we need? Common denominators. So between the first two, between four and three, what is the least common denominator between those two? Well, we'll have to take into account a factor of four and a factor of three, so we're looking at 12. So we only have to combine together on the inside of the fraction, or on the inside of the parentheses, excuse me. So only these two fractions need to have common denominators, and these two fractions need to have common denominators. And what's the least common between these two? Same story. Sometimes it works out that way. 12. So we have to get common denominator and common denominator so we can work on the inside of our parentheses first. So in order to turn 4 into 12, we have to multiply this first one by 3. And whatever we do to the bottom, we have to do to the top. And then over here, to turn 3 into 12, we have to multiply top and bottom by 4. So now, this first chunk of parentheses is going to turn into what? 3 times 1 is 3. 3 times 4, 12. I've got 3 twelfths, and we're adding on to it. 4 times 2 is 8, and 4 times 3, 12. We have that common denominator, so now we would be able to combine those together. And we will in a second, but let's deal with this one first. We have a common denominator of 12 already present on the first fraction, so you don't have to change anything there. But in this case, to turn 4 into 12, what do we have to multiply by? 3, and whatever we do to the bottom, we have to do to the top. So again, we didn't have to alter this first one, but now we're adding on 3 times 1, which is 3, over 4 times 3, which is 12. So now we do have common denominators on the inside of our fractions. So let's actually combine those together. And what will we have? And our first chunk, 8 and 3 together gives us what? 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 times 11, 12, 13, 14, 12. And what are we doing now? We finished the parentheses. There aren't any exponents, so now we're going to multiply and divide. So we're multiplying these two together. And we don't physically want to multiply 11 times 14 and 12 times 12. Let's just break them down from here. So are there any common factors, top and bottom, between 14 and 12? Yes. So let's break it up into some of the factors and see what we'll cancel. So 11 is prime. We can't break that one up. But 12, again, and 14 share one in common, a 2. So let's break up 12 into 2 times 6. And 14, let's break it up into 2 times 7. And we won't have to touch that other 12 because it doesn't share anything else in common with the numerator. So all that we can reduce here is the 2. So in the top, what do we have when we multiply? We've got 11 times 7, which is 77, all over what? 6 times 12. And I have to do that off on the side. 12 times 6 gives us what? 6 times 2, we get 12. Carry the 1. 6 plus another 1, we get 72. 72 on the bottom. And we'll leave it in that form. There's nothing that those two share in common that we could reduce, or we'd see the factors top and bottom over here. Okay. They're tricky ones, but we're still following the same order of operations. So let's practice if we have to plug in the x and the y values into our expression. We want to evaluate 2x plus y squared if x is negative 1 half and y is 1 third. So whenever we're plugging in a value for our variable, make room for the thing and then plug it in. Parentheses are never going to hurt us. 
So we're taking 2 and we're multiplying it by what? Our x value of negative 1 half. And we're adding on to that our y value, which is 1 third. And we want to square that thing. So in both of those cases, the parentheses are very important. Because on the first term, this indicates that we have to do what? Multiplication. And in this one, our base is one-third, and we have to raise that to the second power. So in our order of operations, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, we can't do anything in the parentheses, so next in line is the exponents. So I still have two times negative one-half. We haven't touched that one. But we're adding on to it what? One-third times one-third. So one times one in the top will still give us one. And three times three in the bottom will give us nine. So we took care of the P and the E. Multiplication is next. So when we multiply these guys together, what are we going to get? I've got a positive times a negative, which is a negative. And what is one half of two? One half of two is just one. So we're trying to combine these two together. Now we're on to addition and subtraction. In order to combine those, we need common denominators. And if we need to see negative 1 as a fraction, we can put it over 1. And our common denominator is 9. To turn 1 into 9, we have to multiply by 9 over 9. So what do we get? I've got negative 9 ninths, or negative 1, plus 1 ninth. So we have that same denominator. And as we add across the top, which of those holds more weight, the positive or the negative? The negative, and the difference between those is 8. So we've got negative 8 ninths. Doesn't reduce because those two are relatively prime. They don't share anything in common. So the last thing for this section is for you to practice. Take those two and simplify them down. And in part A, as we follow our order of operations, what do we have to compute first? Nothing in the parentheses, so the exponents are next. So as we evaluate the exponents, what's 2 times 2? 4 up top, and 3 times 3 is 9 down below. So we've got the P, the E, the M, and division done. So addition and subtraction, if we want to combine these guys together, we need to have common denominators. So we'll write 2 with a denominator. And the least common between these two, much like what we just saw, is 9. So to turn 1 into 9, we have to multiply by 9. So our equivalent fractions, we're looking at 4 ninths minus how many? 2 times 9, we get 18 ninths. So we have our common denominator. And as we move across the top, I've got 4 minus 18. Which one holds more weight, the positive or the negative? the negative, and the difference between those two is 14. Now, 14 has what living inside of it? 2 and 7. And then 9 has 3s, so there's nothing common between those two that we could keep reducing. So that one's done. And then part B. Parentheses first on our list, and on the inside, we have to combine these fractions together and these fractions together. Now, these ones already have common denominators, so that's nice, but these ones do not. So, what is the least common denominator between 2 and 5? 10. So, to turn 2 into 10, we have to multiply by 5, and whatever we do to the bottom, we have to do to the top. And to turn 5 into 10, we have to multiply by 2. So let's write out our equivalent fractions, starting with that left-hand side. The negative, we give it to the top, so we have common denominators. And what is this guy going to evaluate to? I've got negative 1 times 5 is negative 5, over 2 times 5, 10, common denominator. And we're adding on to that 2 times 1, which is 2, and 2 times 5, 10. So we have common denominators there. We'll combine them in the next step. And over here, they already had common denominators. So what are we looking at? 7 plus 1 gives me 8 over 
8. And what is 8 divided by 8? That's just 1. And multiplying by 1 doesn't change anything, so that term is basically going away. We're concerned with this piece now. So we have our common denominator of 10. And as we add across the top, which one holds more weight, the positive or the negative? The negative. And the difference between those two is 3. So we've got negative 3 tenths once it's all reduced, and they're relatively prime.